Um, God is good. God is good. Uh, we're privileged and blessed to have uh, such a musically talented student body at Hawaii Mission Academy Maui. Um, we are fortunate this year to have Uncle Corey, a member of this church, teaching our students ukulele lessons for music. Um, if it was Mr. K teaching, we'd be singing a lot of YouTube karaoke. Um, but um, we um, have four of our students here that are going to play special music for uh, church today. Some of probably church's very own. So uh, as they come up and make their way over here, hope you enjoy the song service that they have for you. out there and 
and sure enough, you have a description of right. <laughs> Looking sharp there. But I told him that, uh, you know, I had, I had a little trouble because I tried to pick up five other guys before I from the airport. You didn't have a lot of business. Before I saw him, I tried to pick up five other guys. But no, that was a joke. I'm glad we have a conference president that's very approachable and uh, has a sense of humor and loves Jesus a lot. So with that, Happy Sabbath, Church. I tell you, my heart is already full due to the fact of just being able to. So you saw me leave the platform as soon as the cakey started playing. I mean, I'm off the platform. I'm on the front row. <laughs> I'm getting some pictures because, look, there's just something about our young people that help lead us in worship in church that just doesn't it touch your heart as well? And I, I noticed I wasn't the only one that had my phone out taking some, some pictures. So when there's children up in front, the cameras always come out. But this is what I've noticed. As soon as I step to the pulpit, the cameras are all put down. I mean, <laughs> what is up with that? <laughs> so it was just, and what a kind uh, introduction, uh, Joey. That's very, very uh, kind of you. It is, look, it is such a privilege to be here. You, Maybe you remember this or don't remember that this was a weekend for convocation. So we had scheduled this weekend for convocation here on Maui, but we had to, we had to cancel it last year because of this thing called COVID-19 and this pandemic. Then when the numbers started shooting up again, we thought, you know, we better just be careful. And so we postponed it again uh, this year. So. Professor Joe Kidder from the seminary was scheduled to be here to speak. I had arranged it and uh, I just always love listening to, to whatever he has to share. He has a phenomenal conversion story. That, now look, I've heard him share this on a number of occasions and I, I, I tell Joe, I said, listen, I wanna bring you out to Hawaii, but you must tell your story because my heart is touched every single time he tells that, that story. But uh, we're going to just plan on him being here uh, next year. Now, look, I'm out and about as president of the, ha the, the Hawaii Conference. We have 33 churches. I'm out worshiping in our churches just as much as I can. But ever since this pandemic has hit, it's, look, we all have masks on. We need to have masks on. But one of the difficult things for me as a communicator standing up here in front of all of you is I can't see your faces. I don't know if you're smiling or not. You are smiling, right? So this is what I have discovered. You can see it in the eyes. Look at the eyes. Twinkle, I can see you're smiling. I can see it in your eyes. Now, I've also noticed that a number of you have some very specialized masks that look very, very nice. I'm seriously thinking about having a mask and I want printed on the outside, I miss potlucks. That, that's, that's what I, <laughs> it's just like, because I miss Paul Luck. And it's not, it's not necessarily because of the food, you have to understand. It's the talk story, it's the aloha, it's the fellowship, it's the ohana together. Now that's not just anything, but I mean, I love the food, look at me, I love food. But I just miss us not being able to after church just to fellowship together. But we'll get there, we'll get there. Someday soon, we're going to get there. But I do want to say something about convocation. So I was so happy. I walked in and I saw my friend sat. We had a chance to just chat a little bit. Because, you know, I go back over 15 years. I remember the church when it was flipped the other direction. So I was here during the entire time of the refurbishing. And I can remember I, I was over here one week and I, I, I told Rob Lloyd we were traveling together. I said, listen, let's, let's go by and see what's happening at the uh, Kahului Church. So we walked in. I'll never forget this. Sat. I walked in way up. I mean, it was like it reached into the sky somewhere. There was Sat way up there on the scaffold. I said, Sat, what are you doing up there? You need to come down. That's not safe up there. But my, the amount of work that went into this. And actually, one of my fondest memories of a convocation, now you may remember this. So it was convocation. It was here on Maui. And there was discussion, listen, can we actually have it at Ka'alui? Because the refurbishing was far from finished. 
And I remember Pastor Vera says, yeah, you, we're, we're going to have it here. He said, listen, Ralph, don't worry about it. Just plan it, schedule it, we'll have it. So I still remember it. Just, it was just a concrete slab. Do you remember it? Do you remember this concrete? Just a concrete slab, no enclosed sides. There was chairs, and the lights were just hanging from some electrical cords. I was saying, this is just amazing. But we were all together. We all worshiped. It was absolutely wonderful. And for me, very, very special memories. I want to also thank you for the lay. So beautiful, these lays that are given to me. The little boy that came up, we fist pumped afterwards. I don't know if you saw that. You know, normally you get a hug, but this time we just fist pumped. That's going to be a very, very special memory too. But I don't know if I've ever told you this before. Have I shared with you what I've been doing with my lays ever since I first came to Hawaii? So when I first came, I mean, when Shannon and I arrived at the airport for the very first time, lays, lays, I mean lays all over the place, beautiful lays. Look, there has not been a week that has gone by in 15 and a half years, but what I have received at least a lay or multiple lays. But I first started receiving these lays. Beautiful place on the shoulder, smell lovely, look lovely. I'd only been here just a very short time, and I, I, I said to myself, I, and once I began to understand the aloha behind the lay, I said, I, I cannot, I could not twinkle, I could not, I could not throw a lay away. It was just so beautiful and so significant. So I thought, what in the world am I going to do with, with a lay? Because I'm getting these every single week. So I decided that what seemed appropriate to pass on the lay would be to place it on a grave at Punch Bowl. And so I didn't know anyone buried at Punch Bowl. I did some research and discovered a Marine by the name of Henry Hansen. It's the story of Okinawa. Remember Iwo Jima, they, they, it was a, they took this mountaintop and it was a famous picture of the raising of the flag. I think there were five or six Marines. He was one of them. But he was tragically killed five days later. But I have, for 15 and a half years, every single lay that I have received, I have journeyed up there either Sabbath afternoon or on a Sunday, and I have placed my lay on his grave as a way of expressing aloha to those that have given far greater sacrifice than I've ever given in my life. And the lay is acknowledging that sacrifice, and all those who are buried there are military men and women who have served so faithfully so that we have the freedoms here in this country. And so with your permission, these lays will be placed on the grave of Henry Hansen. I can guarantee you there is no other grave site at Punchbowl that has received more lays. He has received hundreds of lays through the years, and these will be included if it's okay with you. So listen, I just want to thank Seth. I'm so proud of our school here, HMA Maui. Just appreciate Seth, your leadership and uh, all that's taking place over at the school. I want to also mention Pastor Vasili and Marina. We have known each other for a very long time. Thank you for praying for his family. I've been spending some time communicating with him and it's just a real pr privilege for me to be a, uh, a colleague of his serving in Hawaii. So thank you for that. I want to invite you to open your, your scriptures to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 15. So Matthew's Gospel chapter 15. There's just something in there I want to bring to your attention that I have missed actually for many years. And I was reading it here recently and I noticed it and I thought, man, there is, there is something significant about that. So it really impacted my life. I want to have a chance to let it impact your life too. But by now you know that I like to tell preacher stories. I'm a preacher, raised in a preacher's home, and so I've just heard preacher stories all of my life. This is a story that I heard recently from my cousin Dwight Nelson. So Dwight, you might know Elder Nelson, he's the pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church back at Andrews University. So we're first cousins. So I heard Dwight tell this story. It's a preacher story. It's a story about a pastor and his wife who had just had a baby. So this, this pastor is an Episcopal pastor, so you can tell. So they wear the white collar. That's how they're identified. You see that white? So we all know this. You see this white collar, you know they're a pastor. So he's Episcopal pastor. 
he has on his white collar, he's out doing some visitation, and he thinks, hey, listen, I, I'm going to go by and visit my wife in the hospital. She's still in the hospital, just had this baby. So he's out visiting. He still has his collar on. So he goes into the hospital, walks into the room, his collar, walks into the room, sees his wife there. So he walks in, and he, he bends down, and he gives her a hug and gives her a kiss. They chat for a little while. And before he leaves, he bends down and he gives her a hug and gives her a kiss. And as soon as he's out the door, the wife's roommate turns to her and exclaims, my, 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 your pastor is sure a lot more friendly than mine. <laughs> oh, I love that story. So listen, by now you should have been able to find John's Gospel chapter 15. Now listen, as soon as I say John 15, your mind goes immediately to probably the best known section in John 15. It's the teaching of Jesus, the branch to the vine, abiding in Christ, Christ abiding in you like the branches to the vine and the vine is to the branch. That's what's most familiar. But the gospel of John chapter 15 is all red letter edition. So this whole chapter is a teaching by Jesus himself, red letters. But this is what I have missed before, and I want to point this out, because we're going to read three verses, and there is one word that is mentioned three times, rapid fire, just like this. Three verses, one word, three times. See if you pick it up. Here we go. This is, we're going to pick this up now and start reading in John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 13, looking for one word mentioned three times in three verses. Here we go. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Verse 14, you are my friends. Are you starting to pick up something here? You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, verse 15, no longer do I call you servant. So this is Jesus speaking now. It's red letters. No longer do I call you a servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. For I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I have made known for you. So what's the word that Jesus used three times in three verses? What's the word? Friends. Very good. Are you familiar with the author by the name of Philip Yancey? Does Yancey ring a bell? So Philip Yancey is probably one of the most, I would say, prolific contemporary Christian authors alive today. I mean, this guy has written multiple, multiple books. What's so amazing about grace? Where is God when it hurts? These are some of the books that he writes. Now, he lives in Colorado for a reason. He loves the mountains. He's a mountain climber. So Colorado is a perfect place to be. Well, the story is told about Yancey that not too long ago, Yancey decided that he wanted to go on a journey and somehow, if he could, he wanted to discover, is there a way of finding the core message of all the scripture in one sentence. So this was the journey that he was on. He was gonna see if he could, in the reading of scripture, find the very core, the very essence, the meaning of scriptures in one sentence. Well, a friend of his heard what was taking place or heard that Yancey was thinking about doing this. So the friend said, hey, listen, Yancey, I've got an idea. I've got a cabin. It's in Colorado. It's in the mountains. I'm not using it. I don't need it. Would you like to use it? Oh, Yancey, he's all over that. So he puts a few clothes together, just a little bit of food and his Bible, and he heads off into this camp, this, this cabin. And that's all he does is read. He's reading scriptures. He's not racing. Thoroughly, thoughtfully, he's reading looking for, in his opinion, what would be the central theme, the message coming from scriptures. And as he was reading, as he tells the story, he says, actually, it all started to come together when he got to the cross. He gets to the cross, the story of the cross in Calvary. It, it begins to all come together. And at the end of his journey, there, reading scriptures in this cabin in Colorado, he came up with a sentence. It's not even a long sentence. It is a short sentence as to what he believes to be the very essence of the message of Scripture. Four words. And if you've looked at the title of the sermon in your bulletin today, you'll know what those four words are. Here it is. Four words. Yancey. Can 
we be friends? Can we be friends? Speaking of friends, I want to take you to a character long before Yancey came along. His name is William Miller. Now, you should recognize the name of William Miller. William Miller is one of ours. He's one of the founders of this church that we call Seventh-day Adventist, William Miller. William Miller is a fascinating story. In fact, I obviously don't have time to talk about William Miller much here today, except to share this one little vignette with you. So William Miller is a Baptist farmer. That's what he did. And the thing is, he would have Christian neighbors and friends and church. And it seemed like they were always coming up to him with questions and saying, hey, listen, there's discrepancy in scriptures. How in the world can you coincide? It seems like they're saying two opposite things. And it was really frustrating to William Miller. And in fact, he even had questions himself. And so he decided, hey, look, I'm going to figure this out by reading scripture. Now, remember, I think I mentioned this. William Miller's a farmer. He's a farmer. Farmers in the 1800s, they are working long days. So he would work all day long. At the end of the day, he had a little wooden desk. He had a little lamp. So this would be an oil lamp. So there's no electricity. He had a little lamp. And the only thing he had for study, he had his Bible and he had Cruden's Concordance. And he started in in Genesis, and he would just read. And any time he came across something that didn't make sense, or there seemed to be some discrepancy, he had his Bible, he had his concordance, and he'd start comparing Scripture with Scripture. And he would do this night after night after night, never racing, thoroughly, thoughtfully. In fact, it was William Miller that came to eventually Daniel 8, 14. And of course, that's where we've launched this whole biblical teaching as far as the investigative judgment, the heavenly sanctuary. That was William Miller. But do you realize, do you know what his testimony was at the end of this journey? So he had read all the way from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And at the conclusion, this was William Miller's testimony. And I tell you what, my friends, this testimony is so significant that pretty much every time I say this out loud, it gives me chicken skin. This is what William Miller testified. He said, and I quote, the scriptures became my delight and in Jesus I have found a friend. <laughs> is it more beautiful than that? After reading all the way through the scriptures, William Miller's testimony was simply this, the scriptures became my delight, and in Jesus I have found a friend. Let me just push the pause button here for just a moment, my friends. Would you like to have some more delight in your life? Then read scripture. Would you like to have a BFF in your life, a best forever friend? Read scriptures. The scriptures became my delight, and in Jesus I have found a friend. The testimony of William Miller, having read all the way from Genesis through Revelation. So when I was pastoring, before I was invited here to become as president of the, uh, of the Hawaii Conference, I was pastoring a very large church in, uh, in California. And during those years, I was invited on many occasions to preach week of prayer messages on some of our colleges and universities from around the world. So these would be Adventist colleges, Adventist universities, and different places around the world. And they would ask me if I'd be willing to fly to their country and to preach and conduct a week of prayer. Now, it's a good thing that it happened when I was young because this was a lot of work. And I would only accept one, one a year because it took time and I was pastoring a large church and my responsibility was to the church. So I was in the pulpit every single week, but I would take the time to do a week of prayer once a year. So you would preach in the evening to these colleges and universities and you would preach in the morning every single day for one week. And then usually during the day, they would have you doing various things. Very, very busy time. But I had the opportunity and privilege of a uh, week of prayer at Helderberg College. This is in Cape Town, South Africa. 
did a week of prayer at Seleucid University, huge Adventist University in Zimbabwe. Did a week of prayer at Mission College. This is outside of Bangkok, Thailand. Did a week of prayer at Spicer University. This is India. So traveled all over. But I, I discovered a, an interesting phenomenon as soon as I started traveling to these different countries because in their culture, they do something that we don't do in our culture. And I noticed this almost the very first meeting I did. So I would preach, and it usually was at night. In the evening meeting, community people, along with the college students, but community people would come and faculty would come. But I noticed that after I would preach in the evening meeting, I'd be standing out at the door greeting people as they would walk out. And the very first night, people started coming up to me with a pen and their Bible, and they would say, Pastor, would you sign my Bible? Would you sign my Bible? Now, look, it's a culture thing. I understand it. I can guarantee you that after today's service, no one is going to come up to me and ask me to sign anything. It's just not going to happen. It's not our culture. But it's in their culture. And so the very first evening that it happened, I mean, it caught me by surprise. They, they just would hand me the Bible and hand me a pen and say, Pastor, would you sign my Bible? So I, I, would, I signed their Bible. I signed their name. And then it was like I came under this conviction. It was as if the Holy Spirit was saying, listen, Ralph, you're missing a wonderful opportunity to be a witness for Scripture and for me. And so I decided I was going to write something. I wasn't just going to sign my name. They, if they ask me to write, if they, want, if they hand me a pen and their Bible, I'm going to write something. And so I started doing it. And do you want to know what I wrote? <laughs> These are in Bibles all over the place. And it's also in every single Bible I have. I've written two things, two things. And the very first one is Matthew 4.4. 4. It's the story of Jesus after his baptism. The mud is still oozing through his toes from the Jordan River. He makes his way now into the wilderness. Satan comes along and Tim says, Jesus meets temptation by quoting scripture. And by the way, that should be a lesson for all of us. How do you want to meet temptation? Why not quote scripture? So Jesus is tempted. And in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I'd write that in the Bible, Matthew 4, 4. And then I would write the testimony of William Miller. The scriptures became my delight, and in Jesus I have found a friend. Listen, my friends, I don't know what's written in your Bible, but you can't go wrong with those two. Matthew 4, 4, and the personal testimony of William Miller. The scriptures became my delight. And in Jesus, in Jesus, I have found a friend. So listen, let's, let's play a little memory moment here for just a moment. You do know what today is, right? September 11, 2021. Let me ask you a question. You don't answer it out loud. Do you remember where you were 20 years ago when you heard the news, the news of what was happening with the Twin Towers? Can you remember exactly where you were the moment you heard the news? Do you remember? I see you shaking your hands. Now, of course, you have to be 20 years or older. I get it. But as I'm looking out, most of you look like you're 20 years or older. So you're going to remember this. I, as I stand here speaking to you, I could describe in detail where I was, what I was doing when I first heard that news. So let me ask you another question dealing with history and if you remember exactly the moment that it happened. Here's the date, January 13, 2018. Do you remember where you were at that moment? Now, come on, people. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? This is not 20 years ago. This just goes back to 2008. Do I need to remind you about 
the North Korea missile threat attack? Do you remember when that came across your phone? Okay, I see some of you. It's the, it was just in 2018. You remember, do you remember where you were that moment? Listen, when it came across your phone, can I just remind you exactly the wording, what it was? This is it. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. That's the point that got everybody. This is not a drill. In other words, it's coming. So I'll tell you where I was. January, this date in January, so January 13, 2018, was a Sabbath. Do you remember this? It was a Sabbath. I was actually at the airport in line boarding a flight to fly to the Big Island. I was scheduled to preach in Hilo that day. We're literally standing in line and all of us get it at the exact same moment. This is not a drill. Seek immediate shelter. And I remember standing there thinking, all right, 15 minutes, what is it gonna be? It's gonna be a flash and then boom, pow, it's over. That's it, 15 minutes, you got about 15 minutes. Let me tell you what was taking place at the airport. It was pure, sheer, panic because you have to understand that on a saturday most of the people traveling between the islands are tourists so then you have all these tourists that are lined up to get on a plane that they're separated from their family they're back who knows where on the mainland wherever the case may be people literally people started shrieking jumped out of line and started running through the airport where they're going i don't know how far are you going to get in an airport i'm just not sure there were so masses of people started crying some slumped down into a fetal position right there in line, just slumped right down, fetal position, just weeping, 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 thinking this is it, the end of the world, it's over, pal, never going to see family again. Panic. Pure panic. Now I want you to think about something for a moment. Obviously, it never happened. It took a little while for them to send out a message that this was not for real, it was a false alarm. You could read stories afterwards, people on the freeway, people driving on the streets, take off a manhole cover, try to squeeze their kids in, trying to save them. This was real. People thought this was the end of the world. There was a missile attack. Boom, it's over. But let me ask you a question, 15 minutes. 15, if you knew that you had 15 minutes left in life, 15 minutes, that's all. Let me ask you, do the people you love the most, your family, closest here. Do they know that? Do they know that you love them? Because I'm, I'm here to tell you in 15 minutes, that's not enough time to jump on your fel- cell phone and trying to start calling everybody. 15 minutes is not enough. To, so my question is, do the ones you love the most, do they know how much you love them? Let's change up the paradigm a little bit. What about relationships in your life that are a bit bruised, maybe even broken, that haven't been resolved in your life? Could be in your own ohana, could be church related, could be neighbor related, but it's just, it's a relate, it's a bruised relationship. Let me tell you something, my friends, 15 minutes is not enough time to jump on a phone and try to resolve all of this. But here's what I would like to suggest to you. And that is for us not to necessarily be thinking about the last 15 minutes of life. Because let's face it, the last 15 minutes of life, we don't know when, where, why, or how that's going to happen. You can't predict how the last 15 minutes of your life is going to end. None of us can. So there's no point of being consumed over the last 15 minutes. But I would suggest to you that we should be thinking about the first 15 minutes of every single day. That's what we should be thinking about. So here's the question I have for you. What's the very first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? I would suggest to you that there's probably a number of people in here that the very first thing that you do when you open your eyes in the morning is you reach for a device that looks like this. 
This is called a smartphone. And oftentimes it's on the nightstand right next to the bed. And when you wake up and open your eyes, you reach over to this little device and you turn it on. And as soon as this screen lights up, I can promise you this. This is the ecosystem of interruption technology that you hold in your hand. As soon as you wake up in the morning, if you reach over for this and you turn this on and, it's, and the screen lights up, so let me ask you a question. Are any of you on social media, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Twitter and all of a sudden this thing lights up as, whoa, I've got a notification here for Facebook. Wait a minute, somebody has sent me a message. Hey, I've got a text here. Wait, there's, there's some emails that have come through. Or some phones are already set up with world news headlines just streaming by. And all of a sudden, the very first moments of, the very, of, the, of that day that you wake up all of a sudden, your mind is filled with all these distractions of the world, and you can't get those 15 minutes back. Some of you say, well, listen, I, mean, I, need, my, I need my cell phone, I need the cell phone, because it's, it's, it's my alarm clock. I said it is alarm clock. Or that's how I, I can tell what time it is if I wake up in the middle of the night. I can flip it on, I can see what time it is. Listen, my friends, do you realize that there's actually technology out there? It's called a clock, a digital clock. You can buy them that operate on batteries. They even have electricity you can, you can plug it into. And now it's a clock that can wake you up or tell you what time it is during the night or in the morning. So let me just ask you a question. What's the best use of your time the first 15 minutes of every morning? The scriptures or a smartphone? What's the best? So I'm going to share with you a sentence that can revolutionize your life. Are you ready for this? One sentence. You don't even have to write it down. You can memorize this. All right. One sentence. This is for you to remember every single morning from this day forth. Here's the sentence. The word before the world. The word before the world. Say it out loud with me. The word before the world. Now, listen, you might be saying, so, Brad, you know, I mean, I, I have all these emergency things that I mean that came across my phone. Don't you think the God of the universe can handle whatever is on your phone for the first 15, 30 minutes of every single day? Of course he can. But listen, my friends, if you start going to social media, you're going to start scrolling. If you go to a text message, you're thinking about, okay, I got to respond to that. If you go to an email that's on your phone the first 15 minutes, well, I got I to gotta get back in touch with it. By now, your mind is going a myriad of di di directions. This is, an inter this is an instrument of distractions. That's what it is. And if this is the first thing that you take and hold in your hand in the morning, you're so distracted that your mind can't concentrate on the word. But you say, but Pastor Ralph, technology, I've got a Bible app on my phone. I mean, I read from the, the Bible on my phone. Stop. Stop it. We have Bibles like this. You see, the problem is you're reading from your phone. You know what the devil's going to do? He's going to send distractions. He's going to send messages. He's going to send Facebook notices. And you're trying to read the Bible. Oh, wait a minute. I better check on this. Put it down. Go old school. Get a Bible. Hold it in your hands. Push all the distractions away. The first 15... The word before the world. The word before the world. So look, I've mentioned Philip Yancey. Long before Philip Yancey, William Miller. But I'm going to take you back now to somebody 
that is far away and long ago, I want you to hear his words, all right? And for this, we hike together. We find ourselves trekking up this rock-strewn pathway, up, up, up. We find ourselves now standing on a wind-swept summit. And there on that black, billowy, blistering Friday, with Jerusalem silhouetted in the background, we find ourselves standing at the foot of three crosses, and we stare at that center cross. And in that center cross is someone that is hanging with a nailed, scarred, open embrace. And as we stand there, I want you to listen and let these words rest on your heart. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down their life for a friend. For a friend. Because you see, my friend, in the end, it is going to be a relationship that determines your ending and mine. A relationship. So when those last 15 minutes of life come, whenever that is, however that is, when those last 15 minutes of life do come, it's not panic. It's peace. It's peace. Because of the friend that you have fallen in love with in this book. The scriptures became my delight. And in Jesus, I have found a friend. The word before the world. What do you say we make a commitment this Sabbath, this moment, right now, that there is nothing in our lives that will ever take precedent over those first few moments of every day than our relationship with Jesus in his word. Because it's the word before the world. Let's commit our lives to that. God bless you. All right, I believe that we have a closing hymn. It is hymn number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let us stand and sing this hymn together.